So what I want to cover now is an introduction to system dynamics using Minsky. Has, has anybody here installed Minsky? Okay, a couple. Uh, if you want to, if you've got a network connection, you can install it now and perhaps try to do some of the things I do with it as I'm talking through. I want to start from the um, ontology side to some extent because there's a fairly, you know, if we all, you know, I don't need to tell you about Tony Lawson and critical realism. We've got a fair few comments that so far. And my, uh, I've written a critique. Uh, Tony and I are good friends, so it's the sort of thing where you have a, a, a friendly disagreement. But I think the critique that Tony's making about the nature of mathematical modelling and economics is specific to linear models only. Uh, as he has this little quote from his uh, paper, his contribution, now, what is neoclassical economics, where he basically said anybody using mathematics is neoclassical, uh, which I took very well, as you can imagine, um, in, a, in a good sense, uh, is that when you say atoms must be isolated from other countervailing factors to, uh, that could interfere with the outcomes, and to guarantee truly predictable and or deductible, and then deducible, and then so that pretty much describes mathematical modelling in general. Well, you can do a mathematical model of the solar system using Newtonian concepts, no, no ions, nothing, nothing from Einstein needed. And that's a closed system model, as you describe it in the mathematical terms that, that, um, uh, that Tony uh, thinks he's critiquing. But this is a modern astronomer talking about the dynamics of the solar system. Now, can somebody please move their pen? Move your pen. Pick up a pen, move it, move it. Okay, you've just changed the location of, of uh, Jupiter in a billion years' time, perhaps from one side of the sun to the other. That is how sensitive complex, nonlinear, interacting systems are. And in fact, rather than seeing the universe is predictable, then I say, well, it's predictable over a, over a certain time horizon, but unpredictable in the genuine sense of the word. And that's, that's the impact of interactive, non-additive systems is something outside the critique that's been made by critical realism. And I, would, I just would like to see a heterodox economists catch up with that because they're critiquing what neoclassicals do. When I define neoclassicals, anybody who works with equilibrium concepts and leaves out money. Um, so I think that's the critique of critical realism fundamentally applies not to what's being done by heterodox economists, uh, but to what's done by neoclassicals where they try to make everything additive and they, and they take systems which are complex and say, let's make them simple. But they actually make them complicated, which is not by no means the same thing as complex. So system dynamics is fundamentally, it's a system to visually represent differential equations where the differential equations are describing processes of change in a complex system. And the idea is if, if you describe the system structure, you'll find the dynamics arise from the structure. It puts much less emphasis upon what individual behavior is than the neoclassical and then indeed the Austrian obsessions are. Uh, compared to doing the same things with mathematical mathematics directly, which you can do, if you try to do symbolic uh, solutions or everything, you're forced to work in 2D systems. Okay? Once you get to 3D uh, and suddenly you get to 5D, there is no solution symbolically to any of these systems. So what system mass and our mathematic mathematicians tend to work with what they regard as tractable, and that's a tendency to work to reduce things to two-dimensional systems or to take a 3D system and break it into into three 2D versions and try to combine it together. System dynamics began uh, in actually solving a real-world problem and tends to be what you can call structural. You're trying to describe the structure of the system you're looking at and many-dimensional because there'll be many dimensions to virtually any system you try to describe in the real world. And you use simulation and visualization to extend what you can do with mathematics alone. And this has got much, much more powerful over time than it was when it was first invented. Now there's, a, there's many programs available, at least a dozen, and there's many, there are basically three broad groups, what are called process control or engineering, sociology and management, um, are dominated by two programs called VENSIM, Stella and I think, and quite a few, are, not a lot, but a number of economists are using, uh, using VENSIM or Stella to build economic models as well. Then there's engineering, and the dominant program there is called Simulink. Who uses, who uses MATLAB here? Okay. Well, you'll, if you looked at Simulink inside MATLAB? Okay. Uh, Vizsim, which is my favourite, and that's, that's a lot of, I've, I've borrowed a lot of ideas from Vizsim, extended a few other ideas as well. And then you have in mathematics, and trying to model large scale systems, there's Medelica, which is actually a language, compilable computer programming language, which actually has in its core, core code the capability to simulate systems. So you can actually call a routine like Mathemat Mathematica's MD solved to numerically solve a system of differential equations which you state in code 
and that is then compiled and run as at machine code level, so very high performance. And System Modeler and XCOS are based upon that, XCOS being an open source program. Now, Minsky is open source, and it's if, if I wanted to put it in any of those categories, it's halfway between engineering and mathematics. It doesn't have a lot in common with the sociology and process control software packages. And strictly speaking, it's at a primitive level of development because the entire budget so far is under $300,000 US, which is trivial. Compared to the, any, any other program on that list would be have 10 to 100 times as much development going into it. So it's really at the, 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 the infancy. But it still has many advantages over those programs because I've, I've stolen ideas uh, from all sorts of computer software packages, not just uh, from the system dynamics world. So the idea of system dynamics is to represent a, a dynamic set of equations as a system of flowcharts, where the flowcharts give you the causal loops that are involved in the, in, the, in the system itself. And a guy called Jay Forrester, who's just died at the age of about 98, I think, invented this whole idea back in the 1950s. And the stimulus for it was he was approached by a factory that couldn't understand why it had such huge cycles in its manufacturing process. And what he worked out was that there's a, a, a series of time lags and a series of amplifications between different stages in production, what he called the bullwhip effect it was, occurred. So if you imagine a bullwhip, if you're wobbling, if you have anybody done, ever cracked a whip, you ever done that? Okay. Well, you're moving a handle a small amount and the whip is going up down like crazy. He said that's actually built into the time dynamics that exist in the manufacturing process. So a blip in the orders by customers causes a big increase in the warehouse purchases, which bumps up what's happened in the distribution centre, which meant the plant goes crazy. Okay. So that was the original impetus for putting this down in, in a flowchart format. And then ultimately, who's heard of the limits to growth? Who's read the limits to growth? Okay, the rest of you, search for limits to growth PDF. You can download it and take a look at it. And it's highly, highly relevant for the modern day, particularly since we're here at the inauguration of a new president who doesn't seem to take climate change all that seriously. Okay, so the intention of this stuff is to model all the things in our classicals that assume don't exist or assume away because they think they've got to assume them away to do modeling in the first place, which was true in the 19th century. And I really must compliment neoclassical economists for keeping the 19th century alive for so long. I'm trying to drag them into the 21st century. You don't have to assume equilibrium to model a complex system. In fact, assuming it means you can't model it properly. Now, one thing I've got, and this is actually feedback I got from uh, um, a good friend, Tom Ferguson, who's the research director for INET. And INET provided the first funding for Minsky. And he quote, unquote, why is Minsky so difficult to use? Okay. Well, my answer is because economists aren't familiar with system dynamics in the first place. If they could see some of the other programs, they wouldn't be calling Minsky complicated. It has a better interface, I think, than the industry leader, Vensim. So I'm going to show you here uh, a model of what's called this, – this is you've heard of Lorenz's butterfly effect? Okay. This is Lorenz's butterfly effect uh, done in, in, um, in Vensim. And if I simulate it, which I do by clicking on this button, then you see the result. That was exciting, wasn't it? Told you a lot. Okay. And to see the equations, I've got to go inside the box here. And first thing I get to do is to, is to say what shape it has. Well, let's make it a hexagon. Why the hell am I changing formatting as my first step in defining an a system? Well, there's the equation tab. And the equation has dx or the initial value of initial x. And somewhere inside that, I've got to set up a set of equations. Okay? All done in text. So that's, that's Vensim. And that's the industry leader. Now... Let's take a look at the same thing in Minsky. Okay. And so what Minsky has, and I can actually read the equations to you by working from the, the system, equation, system dynamics uses integration rather than differentiation as the first step because integration is a smoother operation than differentiation. If you think about the shape of a hill, it changes quite radically. The area beneath the hill uh, if, you, if you take like a, a if you take a cutaway of the hill, the area doesn't change anywhere near as fast as the slope of the hill does. So integration is a smoother process. So reading this backwards, it says x is the differential of x is equal to a multiplied by y minus x. So the equations are obvious on the palette as well. And if I simulate, you see it in real time, okay. and you can see why when you hear about the butterfly effect. The reason is when Lorenz simulated this in three dimensions for the, or two, two or three dimensions for the first time, the pattern of the cycles of the unstable system looked like the, looked like the wings of a butterfly. So 
uh, and design, defining a model in Minsky is quite straightforward. If I wanted to make that time something else like, oh, I'll show you that in, in, on a blank card rather than damaging this model, but it's very easy to define an equation on that screen. So that's that's the, 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 the starting point of, of Minsky. It's actually easier than most of the other system dynamics programs to program in. It's the paradigm that's new to economists and they have to really learn because they've learned the wrong stuff. Equilibrium modeling, difference equations, and so on. And the key insight coming out of that little model there is, 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 two, well, is twofold. That is an incredibly simple system. In fact, I can show you the equations. You won't necessarily see them from the back of the room. But this is saying dx dt equals a times y minus x, dy dt equals x multiplied by b minus z minus y, and dz dt equals x times y minus c times z. X, Y, and Z are the variables. A, uh, a, a, B, and C are the parameters and their constants. Pretty hard to imagine a simpler model than that. That's the behavior it gives you. Highly complicated. So complex behavior out of simple systems is, is the complex system insight there. And uh, that's just, again, the showing the equations in more detail. So if you wanted to simulate the model again, of course, I'll give you a copy of this presentation. All you've got to do is build that system and you'll have a d demonstration of Lorenz's model. Now, there was plenty of advances in Minsky's user interface, so I'll show you those. Uh, let's just start a new model here. Okay. I'll make it a bit smaller so I can have that on screen while I, while I talk. So let's just shrink the window a bit. Okay. You saw for a moment there that that's what, I've, what I've shown you in that previous sim simulation is the graph is actually embedded in the canvas and it simulates in real time. Only one or two of the other programs does that, VizSim does. Uh, secondly, you can directly type in variables on the, on the uh, canvas. So if I want to type the word Fred, for example, then I've typed a variable onto the canvas, and onto the canvas, which is your design palette, and I can move it around, which any of the other programs, you can do the same sort of thing. But you can't type directly onto the canvas. What you do in other programs is click on something like a variable entry, give it a name, um, and a value, and then, then you've got to place it on the canvas. I think it's just fast to be able to do stuff by typing directly on the canvas. So if I type a divide by key, I've got the divide by symbol. And if I then say this is equal to another, another entry, uh, then I wire that up. And if I want to say, for example, that there's a, a sine wave coming in behind Fred, so Fred is actually the sine of something, and you have T as, as time, uh, then I do that. And then I can put the graph on there. And I don't need, I mean, all, all, everything, actually, even with the graph, I've forgotten what the, direct, what the direct command is, but you can type a graph directly onto the palette as well. You don't need to go up here all the time. I find it annoying going up and using, uh, having to click on a, on a palette all the time to create stuff. I'd rather work straight to the canvas, a uh, canvas rather. That's what's feasible with Minsky. That can be done. And then you've got your model defined in that sense. And so I'll just stop that at that stage. Um, and it supports formatting. And another thing none of the other programs do, this is quite unique in Minsky, is they don't support anything other than raw text. Whereas with Minsky, if I wanted, for example, uh, let's get just delete Wilma there and make this and said, say, Lambda, and let's call it Lambda um, 0, just for the heck of it, then what I get is a Greek letter, and I'll just make it larger so you can see that, a Greek letter with zero subscripted. It's, we have, we've got a little hassle in making superscripts because the superscript is actually also used for a power. But if I type that and put another title there, then I can do a fair amount of formatting. I'm mucking around there, obviously, but if you want to use mathematical logic in your text of a set of equations and then simulate the same thing, with the other programs, you've got to make a compromise, and rather than typing the Greek letter lambda, you've got to type L-A-M-B-D-A, and that's what you're stuck with. With us, you use LaTeX commands, and you can generate any formatting that LaTeX supports. I'll just uh, do one more thing here. I'm going to make that into a slider, and uh, let's see what the value ranges for the slider. I'll make the start with a value of 1, but have a maximum between 10 and minus 10 with a step size of 1. And then while I'm running the simulation, of course, at the moment, it's going to give me no out. Hang on, dividing by 0. That's not, that shouldn't be working. Let's see. What have I done wrong? 
Okay, now I'm dividing it as I go. So I, I can change parameter values as I'm running a simulation. And actually, I think I've caused a, I've caused a crash there by going back to zero again. So that's, that version is going to crash. Pardon me while I shut it down. By the way, we might as well make the next statement now. Minsky is, is, as I said, it's only had about $300,000 worth of development time so far. Every computer programmer has bugs. You'll find Windows and Microsoft Word and Excel crashing on you occasionally. Did I for, for, for Minsky? It will crash. So my little advice is what I call the Tammany Hall approach to computer programming. Save early and save often. Okay? And save with different names all the time too in case anything actually does go wrong. Uh, and we have a few other tricks that the other programs haven't done. Again, this is easy to do. It still amazes me the other programs haven't done it. Well, let's just bring up another copy of Minsky here. Oh, by the way, if you want to, uh, you can run multiple copies of Minsky. You don't have to have just one. So if you want two or three running at once, you can do that. Um, one thing that if the other programs, if you want to add two numbers together, so I have, say, Fred and Wilma here. For some reason, I always revert to uh, the Flintstones when I do this sort of stuff. Then if I wanted to add a third variable there with the other programs, I'd need to add a, another input to the plus block. But what we thought, well, there's no point in that because um, why don't we overload the operator? So if you want to add multiple ones together, you just keep on going. And so it supports overloading in that sense, where it makes sense. Equally from a plus and minus, divide by, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that's that's feasible then. And the most important thing, this is why I developed it in the first place, you can build stock flow models of the financial system using what we call godly tables. And um, that's so I think in overall the that, that's on the left hand side here I've got the interface for for, um, for um, sim, this uh, XCOS, which is a clone of Simulink. Notice that thing there saying that's that says plot. That's an icon. You don't actually see the plot in the in the model itself, and it doesn't change on screen when you change the model. You're paying if you buy if you buy MATLAB commercially, you're paying at minimum two thousand dollars for that. Okay. So for some reason, they have never got around. It's been around for twenty or thirty years. They haven't got around to making graphs run dynamically on screen, and that's the interface for Stellar, which I think ultimately becomes a bit of a mess. Very very hard to read. And actually, talk about them being spaghetti diagrams. So Minsky is not hard to use. Uh, it's the it's the it's the paradigm which is a new thing for economists to learn. And lots more that I want to do if I can get funding. That's why I've whacked this little window up there. That that links to my website, and uh, link to get funding to, from the public to keep Minsky development going. Because about half the money I've got so far has come from the public, uh, rather than from I've got no money at all from government funding, by the way, for Minsky thus far. Any government anywhere. Now, what Minsky can't do is wonderful stuff like this yet. There's lots of fantastic software that exists out in the marketplace, including things like this one, uh, which lets you design a, an environment and then see how people will move in that environment. All this sort of stuff now is involved in designing offices, designing hospitals, and so on. So Minsky doesn't support that. It's by no means the ants' pants in computer simulation, but it does things which are the, the main advantage is this capacity to model financial dynamics. So I'm going to take you through uh, that after I show the basic paradigm as well. I, we call them godly tables for obvious reasons. I want to keep Win Godly's name alive. So making it part of a software package is a pretty good way to do that. And what you can do using double entry bookkeeping is maintain that very consistent view of financial flows. And you can shuffle around the definition of a financial system in a way that's much easier than working with a flowchart paradigm for the same purpose. If I get the funding, ultimately, probably from the public rather than from government grants, then I'm going to make it much easier to define parameters and constants than currently occurs. I'll show you why in a moment. I want to have two-way design so you can go from mathematical equations to the flowchart and back. At the moment, you only go from the flowchart to the mathematical equations. Support vector operations so we can multiple model, model uh, input-output dynamics, which currently can't be done. I want to enforce dimensional analysis. So you've got flows of money and flows of goods and stocks, which are dollars and flows, which are dollars per year. I want to enforce dimensional analysis in the program. So it makes it easy to follow the logic. And I want to be able to clone the model of a single economy to automatically create a world model with export and import dynamics, financial flows and labelings all automatically provided by the program just as soon as you say you want to have more than one 
economy in the model. And also, we are, we do import data right now, and there, there's some, I'll show you an example at the end of incredible use of Minsky to uh, use empirical data as a part of generating a model of, a, of an actual economy. But I want to be able to do it on a very grand scale, to import large amounts of data and then use the data itself to generate the parameter values for simulation. But that's a long way in the future. And then, most importantly, get to the stage where we can have this as a have multiple users operating at once on one Minsky model, using it to try to control a virtual economy and see what happens when they do things like trying to run a surplus. Yeah. I think we, it's about time we got politicians to experiment on an artificial economy rather than the real one. Be much safer. So that's the intention overall. Now, the flowchart side of Minsky, I'll illustrate using a, 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 mock, a, a reduced version of the of the uh, Goodwin model done by Michel and um, Engelbert Stockhammer from my own university. And that has, if you know, you know this expression, dot, dot y being d, d, y, dt over y. So the percentage rate of change of y is 1 minus w. Percentage rate of change of w is minus c plus r times y. Well, to put that in sort of system dynamics form, what you first do is express it as a pure differential equation. So I multiply across by y and w. That's all that's going on there. And then you integrate the operation. So what you do is say, having defined the y dt equals y times 1 minus w, you then say y is equal to the integral of y multiplied by 1 minus w. And then you put that in a flowchart form, and then you simulate. Now, when you do that, you get a model that looks like this. So I'll just bring up that particular model. This is a, I call it, it's, it's, they call it a pseudo good model, and I agree it's pseudo, but it's very a very nice simplified version of a good one. So let's just make it a bit larger so you can see it and drag it over here. Uh, and then do your simulation and you get the classic Goodwin cycles coming out of that. Okay. So that's the basic idea with Minsky. Now it's pseudo because you're not actually modeling the structure of the economy. You're modeling Y as an index of GDP rather than actual GDP. You're modeling W as a wages index rather than W is the actual wage. And the key thing in, in system dynamics is use it to show the underlying structure. And most of the time, that will lead to cyclical behavior. In fact, as I said, that's how the paradigm came about. Why does our factory have cycles? And to explain it, that's how the actual paradigm was invented by Forrester in the first place. And you start with an incredibly simple model, and you then add complexity over time. So let's actually build that the Goodwin model in system dynamics form. So I'm going to start off by having investment. And by the way, I've seen a lot of people write that the, my, the Goodwin model is a is a supply-driven model. Investment is part of demand. Okay. It, all it's, it, 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 it's, it's a, the Goodwin model has a specification of investment. It doesn't have a specification for consumption. Therefore, consumption is a residual. But it's possible to extend it and include stock dynamics, Metzler cycle stuff, uh, by specifying C, and then stocks become your residual rather than consumption being the residual, but it is a demand-driven model. So investment determines capital stock, capital stock determines output, output determines employment, the rate of employment determines the rate of change of wages, profit is output minus the wage bill, and all profits are invested. Well, actually, I'll build that. I think I've got, I hope I've got time to do, I'll start building the model here. Let's just... Um, Go with a new system again, not save it. So to define that model, I'll start saying here's investment, and I'm going to define what that is later. The ampersand looks like an integration block, so I just type ampersand to get the, the first integration block there, and I'll call that K and give it a value of 300. Let's make it a bit easier to see that. You guys are working. And then say, okay, investment determines capital stock. And then if I divide capital stock by output, by output uh, accelerator, divide capital by output, I get GDP. This is a bug. We haven't got over it yet, but you notice that when I first write something on screen, it's even though I've got it magnified, it comes up in small size, first of all. Divide output by population, so by, by labor productivity. Ah, I'm trying to move it. Okay, there we go and divide the two, and I'm going to have the employment rate, which I, I'm going to use lambda for. Notice the circles there, by the way. If you click in the circle, you drag out an arrow to connect to somebody else. If you drag, click 
elsewhere, you move the object around. That's the basic design idea there. And if I then subtract from that, I've done this so many times, I think I can do it pretty rapidly. Uh, just subtract a, a rate at which workers accept no change in wage rises from the actual level of employment and multiply that by their reaction, the slope of the reaction function they have. And then that's the multiply block. Then that's my Phillips curve. So I'll just call this P, sorry, P underscore uh, H for Phillips. And then I need to, that's going to give me the wage rate. So I need to put another block in there for wages. Let's say wages start at uh, one unit of wages. Um, I now need to take a copy of that variable which is the wages. So the rate of change of wages multiplied by the current value integrated is the wage rate. That's the basic logic of a, it's basically stating out a percentage rate of change function. So I've now got the wage rate. If I multiply the wage rate, ah, and I now say I've made a mistake here. I've got labor productivity divided by, um, output divided by labor productivity is employment rate. No, it's not, it's the employment level. So I'm just going to grab that lot, group it, move it sideways, uh, that's another bug, <laughs> ungroup it, we've got a bit of space there, delete that wire, oh damn, <laughs> I shot myself there didn't I, it was still affecting the group, okay I'm going to stop at that point because it's, uh, I've now embarrassed myself on that one, but what I was r rapidly trying to design, I think you see how fast I was getting there is that model, which is the Goodman model, let's take a look at it. Uh, make it a bit larger. So that's your basic good model. This time properly including labour, the, the employment rate dividing by population. And hit run and you get your good one cycles. So without making a stuff up like that, I can design that model in about two minutes. So it's fairly easy to work with, much easier than people realise because they're just not used to using the paradigm. Yeah. Um, what is that? Like, I'm, I'm not sure if I followed correctly, but you said something more of the stock real consistent logic, which double accounting. Not yet. Not yet. It's coming up. Okay. Now, so there's several tricks that make it much faster to design in Minsky than other software packages. Typing directly onto the canvas is much faster than having to go and click on a palette all the time. Um, being able to write Greek characters, which you can't do at all in the other programs. Using underscore for subscript and uh, the hack caret for superscript, which at the moment only works in dialog boxes. Got to fix that. Using curly brackets to format text. That's all. These are all LaTeX commands. And being able to curve the lines, which is really ridiculously simple. Um, as you see that particular line, as soon as a blue dot turns up, you can curve the line if you if you need to for for appearances' sake. And once you've done it once, you can do it again. And you can also, it looks like a mess. You can straighten it once more. All simple things to do. And if you want to get rid of a line. Just highlight it. When you see the blue dots come up, you can delete it. So all these things are, are fairly straightforward in the program. It's also designed to try to work out where the nearest point is. That's not working all that well this time. Let's just try once more. Ah, have I generated another bug? Ah, pardon me. There's a multiply window. You can actually change the rotation of all these things as well. That's what was getting in the way there. Let's see. Bring it down. Release. Okay, I've stuffed that one up as well. This is getting, ah, oh, that's why. I'm trying to define, what, define Y. It's actually W. It wouldn't let me because Y was already defined over here. Okay? So now I've got it there. Now I can do curve it around and make it larger. I just want to make a bit of space to uh, make room to put the graphs in the middle, as you see, I tend to do there. So, and you saw I can delete something using delete key. That's all incredibly simple stuff, but most of the other programs don't make it that easy to make the changes. So designing a model is pretty easy, but you've got to use a right-click menu quite a bit, by the way. So get used to using your right mouse key. Now, I'm going to add some realism to that. I've got in that model at the moment that all profits are invested, okay? And I've got no depreciation. So if I add depreciation and population growing over time and labor productivity growing over time, uh, I can do that by simply saying, well, this variable here, which is currently a constant, 
with a value of 120, if I add an integral, ah, how do I get W out of that? I was highlighting W, let's just go back, let's delete that one and add an integral to this one. Okay, I found another bug. <laughs> That's supposed to be finding it, adding integral to, to n, not to w. I'll try adding this one, add integral to a. That worked. So I'll just go with that. So I've now made a, which is labor productivity, something which changes over time. If I give a value to alpha of, say, 0 0.15, I'm saying the 0 0.015, I'm saying productivity labor productivity grows at 1.5% per annum. So you can start with a simple model where you have a constant population and constant labor productivity and change it. Uh, I'll just actually see how that works. We made a few Oh, there we go. So I've now got the impact of rising labor productivity turning up in that very simple model. So that's the complete model, if I've done it properly, is here. And now what I've got is depreciation over here. So concentrated depreciation, reducing the value of the real capital stock. And I've got labor productivity growing over time, which is down the bottom here, and population growing over time. Very easy to add those elements to the model. What I've done here is now, because I've now got the wage rate rising, that's why these spirals are occurring here, because... GDP is rising and the wage is rising as well. So you want to work in ratios. I can just say, well, let's actually define a new variable, uh, which is going to be W divided by Y. So take a copy of that variable. Let's whack it up there for this for the heck of it. A copy of Y. Divide wages by GDP, which now gives me the wages share of output. Call that omega. Wire that up, delete that, and just for the heck of it, wire it to here. And then having Y there's a bit silly, let's actually just go for, for Lambda, which I have defined up here. Copy of Lambda, drag it down here. By attaching, well, it's, I haven't actually explained this bit yet. Notice all the graphs have got four entries on the left-hand side, four on the right and eight down the bottom. If you don't put anything down the bottom, you get a simulation over time. If you put something on the, the black on the vertical and the black on the horizontal, you get an XY plot. Again, trying to make it simple to design a complicated graph. And you, you can have to have up to four XY plots on one plot. And of course, you've got two multiple axes, X and Y axes there. And I haven't got any labels there yet, but I can easily, uh, by choosing options, have uh, put a label there and have uh, what this is wages share and this is employment rate. So you can then document fairly easily. Now what Minsky is doing behind the scenes is building a system of equations for you. And that's what it actually simulates as well, the entire block of equations. And from the file, and if you want to actually document what you're doing, you can export that out in LaTeX. Who uses LaTeX here? Anybody? Good. Okay. Supports LaTeX. And if you don't use LaTeX, if you use math, math type in Word, you can cut and paste the equations directly into a Word set of equations, which is what I've done most of the time here. You can also export the model to MATLAB. So you can actually build a visual model visually in, in Minsky and then put it in MATLAB for much higher uh, level numerical analysis. And you can export the results of a simulation to a CSV file, so you can graph using other programs if you want to as well. So it's got a lot of features for a program that's only had about 3,000 hours of development time. Now, one little extra piece of realism here. Goodwin had capitalists investing all their profits. Now, the way that I built my Minsky model in the first place was to say, well, it's not true they do that. They invest more during a boom and less during a slump. And then... So I had, I'm going to add now an investment function just as a linear function of the rate of profit. And I do that, and nothing appears to change 
Anybody tell me why nothing has changed so far? Apparently, in terms of the qualitative dynamics of the model, it still looks just like the Minsky, the, the Goodwin model beforehand. Why hasn't it changed? It's still two-dimensional. Okay. I've added another causal element there, but I haven't added another differential equation to the system. And I'll show you why that's important in a moment. Now, of course, the insight to bring turn Goodwin to Minsky was to say, well, when capitalists invest more than profits, they, they borrow the money. They borrow it from banks, and then, of course, uh, they pay off debt when investment, when design investment is less than profits, and they've got to pay interest. So you put that together, and again, that's a very simple extension of the model. All I've done is take the same structure I've got here for the Phillips curve and have it down here for an investment function. Get a rate of profit, have a rate of a zero rate of profit at which capitalists just invest what they earn, uh, and then a slope saying if they get you know profits 1% higher, how much more do they invest? Multiply the investment function by output, you get gross real investment. If gross real investment exceeds uh, actual profits, there's a change in debt, and you've got to pay interest on debt, so you subtract interest on debt from output, and there you've got the basics of a model involving debt inside. Then now you simulate this model, and notice what's happening. The cycles in employment are getting smaller. Hey, wonderful, we've got a great moderation going on. Keep it going for a while. And you have a breakdown. Yeah. So a period of apparent moderation precedes a breakdown. Now that's what we're getting out of this model as simple as that. And with no understanding necessarily of Minsky, just saying let's add another element of realism to the model, we're getting Minsky's financial stability hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. It's just it, you know, that's what I did when I, when I first did the, my Minsky paper back in '92, published '95. Um, but the, the observation here is incredibly simple behaviors give you complex outcomes out of the structure of the model. You don't need complex behavior by your entities to get complex systems outcomes. In fact, it's pretty Carl Chiarella, who's probably the lead was the leading developer of nonlinear dynamical models for the last 20 or so years. Carl used to insist that using linear behavioral functions wherever possible because he said, therefore, you, your, your nonlinearities were intrinsic nonlinearities. They come out of wages being multiplied by labor to work out the wage bill, for example, two variables multiplied together. So my, my preference is to start with the linear and then add nonlinear after that, where they're Again, simple but realistic nonlinear functions. So the, the basic shape is the one that Phillips argued for back in his papers before the, the Phillips Curve empirical paper, that there's a nonlinear relationship between employment rate and wage demands. I put a nonlinear relationship between profit and investment. But a linear one gives you the basic cycles all the same. Okay. Yeah. But what's actually, it's, I actually explain it. The interesting thing about doing a simple model like this is uh, you have to, it gives you a chance to say, where is this complexity coming from? Because if you look at Minsky's explanation of why there'd be a breakdown, a large part of it talked about increasing the interest rate. Now, that, I've got a fixed interest rate in that model, so I can't explain it that way. You also talk about Ponzi investors. All the investment in that creates factories. There's no Ponzi investment going on. So I'm still getting the basic idea of a breakdown, and I'm getting this amazing phenomenon of a moderation before the crisis. So stripping it down to that bare essentials, the answer to why the cycles occur became income distribution. And that is that as, you have any, if you, as, the, as the boom goes on, wages, employment uh, rises, the employment rate rises, wage demands increase, more of the output goes to workers than capitalists expected fundamentally. Uh, more also goes to bankers because they've got interest on debt that they accumulated during the boom. So the boom actually results in having less uh, less profit than they expected because of income distributional effects. Therefore, they reduce investment and therefore the cycle turns around. So it's actually your explanation for the Goodwin cycle and for the Minsky breakdown is all about 
the boom itself changing the distribution of income. So you don't need the interest rate. If you add the interest rate changes in there, you're being more realistic. But you don't need them to get the basic cycle. And that's why, again, it's worth starting at a simple level and adding the complexity later. Okay. So, and this is Minsky's basic insight. Now, it's crazy in some ways that something is regarded as as deep as Minsky, which clearly it was, Minsky's work was, drops out of so simply out of such a simple model. And equally, there's an insight that Minsky didn't have, and that is that a great moderation precedes the crisis, which is what we empirically observed in, in, in the 2007. And if you look at the data for the Great Depression, even though it's much rougher data, the same sort of phenomenon is going on there as well. So rather than a period of, of moderation, meaning, oh, great, we've solved the, the, the boom and bust cycle, if you're ignoring the level of private debt, you're getting the beginning of a breakdown. So it's a simple model with complex behaviour, and that's really why it's such in, so important to work in these non-linear, non-equilibrium way of thinking. And the non-linearities in that model are entirely in, uh, in, inherent. You can't get rid of them. It's not because I've got non-linear behaviour that I get non-linear results. I've got linear behaviour and non-linear results. Okay? So it's inherent non-linearities, wages times labour determining the wage bill. And complexity arises in models with three or more dimensions. Uh, and the three dimensions of that model are the wages share of GDP, the employment rate and the debt to GDP ratio. Okay? So adding in the third dimension is what makes the behaviour so very different. And there's a technical issue going on there, uh, which comes out of something you can learn if you learn the properties of ordinary differential equations because if you, with system of differential equations, you can work out the, what equilibria may apply where all the rates of change are zero. And the stability of properties of those equilibria are mapped to the properties of a polynomial generated around the equilibria. And in reduced form, the Goodwin model has two system states. Therefore, with those two system states, you get a, poly, you get a quadratic. My model adds in the debt ratio. Therefore, you have... A, a, a cubic equation, third order polynomial. Now, the properties of a third order polynomial are much more interesting in a dynamic sense than 2D because if you have a, a 2D model, then it's either got real, it's either got two real or two complex eigenvalues. And the real parts can be positive or negative. Maybe one's positive, the other's negative, so you get a saddle, that sort of thing. That's the end of the complexity of a 2D model. The 3D model there must be one real eigenvalue for the simple reason that a cubic equation from between infinity to minus to plus infinity must cross the x-axis. Okay. So therefore, you're going to get one real eigenvalue, which might, if it's negative, you're talking about a stable node. If it's positive, you've got an unstable node. Now, the other two can be real or complex. If they're complex, then the real part of the complex eigenvalue can be the dominant eigenvalue in the system. You're all used to the idea of eigenvalues and and so on. Okay. But <laughs> it's a number to represent whether a system is expanding or contracting space. Okay. If you have a, a three dimensional model, it's like me. Uh, this, I've got an object here. Am I throwing it away or bringing it closer to me? If I'm throwing it away, the dominant eigenvalue is positive. If I'm pulling it towards me, the dominant eigenvalue is negative. So, what you get with a model like, like the, uh, the Goodman model is that this, if you, this, this is this particular polynomial crosses the x-axis three times, so it has three real eigenvalues. So all its, all its terms are either negative, which are pulling towards, or positive, pushing away, but no cyclical behaviour. This one, as I said, it necessarily has to cross the x-axis, so there's one real eigenvalue in there, which happens to be negative in this particular uh, uh, cubic. But the two complex eigenvalues can, be, can have a negative real part, which means they're attractors, a zero real part, which means it's a purely cyclical system, or positive real part, meaning they're repellers, but they can be bigger or smaller than the, the, uh, the real eigenvalue. So you get quite a wide, wide range of potential outcomes. In, the, in my model, the, the, you can define two effects. There are three equilibria, but two of them are significant. One is a good equilibrium where you have a positive wages share of GDP, a positive employment rate, and a finite debt ratio. And the bad one has zero wages, zero employment, and infinite debt ratio. That's a black hole of debt, effectively. Um, and of course, debt. If I don't have, if you wanted to make it more realistic, you could add bankruptcy as a way of reducing the scale of the black hole. I haven't done that yet, but somebody could easily do that. 
Now, when you analyze it, you find the real eigenvalue of both equilibria negative, which means that they're attractors along that particular axis. Um, but the complex one of the good eigenvalue has zero real part for low levels of the reactivity of capitalists to the rate of profit. So if I come down here and I change the slope value of the slope factor I've got here and I make that 5 rather than 10 and I then re-simulate this model, I get stability. You can see the employment rate converging, debt ratio becoming constant, so on and so forth. Okay. If I increase that value, what I'll do this time is make, I'll make a copy of that, whack it up here, make it into a slider. I've got to stuff around a bit, unfortunately, because there are some bugs in the program, so as I've mentioned. I'm trying to make it into a parameter, but I, sure I can't do that for some reason. Oh, the maximum value of... Ah. Maximum value of 10. Minimum value of, say, 1. Step size of 1. Okay. So I can now show that model with a low level and then increase the reactivity of the profit function or change it back again. So you can test out a model in real time in that sense. But you can see the change from the low reactivity of capitalists to the rate of prop to the rate of profit in terms of how much they invest to high reactivity takes you from a stable to an unstable system. So the model has cycles to equilibrium for low values of the reactivity of capitalists, approaches equilibrium for high values, but then diverges as it gets nearer, which is strange behaviour. You cannot get that out of a linear model. It's called a strange repeller. And the model may have what's called a, a hidden attractor. So I've, I've linked a, a, a mathematical academic paper on the particular types of models to that part of the presentation, so you can dive in further. Now, again, this is an incredibly simple model, but it captures the essence of the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, there was this period of apparent cycles to equilibrium, followed by a breakdown. Great moderation followed by a breakdown. That's what we saw. Now, in the model itself, what I'm getting is the, as you increase the reactivity of capitalists to the rate of profit, the complex eigenvalue goes from having no real part to positive real part. And that will give you the overall breakdown. But again, I can explain that in, in more detail if you uh, take a look in my, new, my next book and also um, uh, some of my other lectures. Now, that's all stuff that I've shown you so far that you can do with any other program. Um, so what I'm going to do now in a moment, I'm actually, do you feel like a break? You happy to keep on going? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, th that can be done in any of the other programs. Minsky gives no intrinsic advance over the other programs in that sort of modeling. What it does add is the capacity to model a financial system using double entry bookkeeping. And the difficulty of doing that with the flowchart paradigm is varies in terms of how likely you are to make this mistake, depending on which software package you're looking at. But you can give the wrong sign to one of the flows. You can have something adding to one flow and adding to another rather than adding to one and subtracting from another. Um, and you also want to show the same entity as an asset for one agent and a liability for the other. So effectively, to account for any transaction, you should actually show it four times. Two for a for a, from going from an asset to a liability and two going from liability to an asset. Now, if you do that using flowchart diagrams, you get a spaghetti code mess. You're looking at a bowl of spaghetti in terms of all the wires and stuff like that. It's very, very hard to work out what's going on. Whereas there is, there has been a graphical user interface for showing financial flows for half, half a millennia now. It's called double entry bookkeeping. Anybody here learn accounting? No, I, I didn't. I've learned it the hard way by designing Minsky. So Minsky implements the tabular approach as an alternative way of building those differential equations. Now, if you look at the history, I recommend this book by Jane Gleason White on how double entry came about and what its impact was socially and economically. But the essential concept is you record uh, the same transaction twice on each row in the ledger book to make sure that you sum each row to zero, therefore you've properly recorded the transaction 
once as a positive for adding to some particular account and once as a negative. And therefore, a properly accounted row sums to zero. That's, that's the check that accounting gives you. They have three types of accounts. Assets, which are a positive for your, whoever you're looking at. Liabilities, which are a negative. And finally, equity, which is the net worth of whatever agent you're looking at by subtracting liabilities from assets. And the fun, what they call the fundamental law of accounting is that assets minus liabilities equals equity, or sometimes you'll see it described as capital. And A minus L equals E. It's your basic equation. Well, that therefore means A minus L minus E equals zero. Okay. So in that sense, that's that's the fundamental role. You you must do that accounting every time, otherwise you'll stuff up, as economists have with things like money money multiplier model. Uh, accountants use a convention of debits and credits, uh, and Minsky can do that as well, but I find it quite confusing. So the default convention we've developed in Minsky is that assets are shown as a positive, which makes sense. Liabilities are shown as a negative. Again, that makes sense. But equity is also shown as a negative. Now, that's counterintuitive. But what it, we do it that way is because adding up every row, therefore, should give you zero. So if you have A, a minus L minus e equal to zero when you define all three as positive, uh, then if assets are defined to be positive uh, and both liabilities and equities are defined to be negative, then if you sum up a properly recorded row, it's going to give you zero. Okay, A plus L plus C will give you zero. So that's the basic convention, and it's checked with every entry by Minsky. So let's actually I'll show, illustrate this one. Let's start with a, a new file. This will complain about me not shaving changes. That's okay. Notice the bank icon there. So to access that, click on that, drag it somewhere, click on put it on the campus. We can make that one larger as well. And you either right, you either double click to bring up this table, or right click and choose Open Godly Table to bring up a table. Now, at the moment, I know you can't see the text on screen. We're using a third-party spreadsheet right now. We can't magnify or or shrink its size. It's just that one stock size. So that's another thing I want to change with with more funding. Uh, so there's the table, and notice that when I click, uh, when, the, when we look at the table first of all, um, it says Flock, st flow variables with a V flip pointing down to show that they're shown this way. Stock variables with an arrow pointing to the right-hand side to show they're shown in the columns. And then this thing which currently says no asset class. Now, what that is there for is that actually reflects my learning process as I develop Minsky because when I first did this stuff, I was using single entry tables. And therefore, there's a little checkbox on the left-hand side that says double entry. Now, we only brought in double entry power to the program later in its development because I hadn't realized how important it was at the time. So I've learned it by building Minsky. And we used to also have arbitrary column types. We didn't actually specify assets, liabilities, and equity. So that little thing saying no asset class, when you click on it, it gives a drop down saying make it an asset, a liability, or equity. Now, what I want to do. Um, in future versions is first of all make enforced double entry, no choice. Okay. Make it necessarily double entry. And then pre-allocate pre one column to assets, one to liabilities, and one to equity. So you have all three turning up there. And if you add an additional column in any of those boundaries, you get an additional asset or a liability or perhaps an equity. Um, at the present, however, what you've got to do is choose which account you're talking about from a drop-down menu. So I'm going to define the simplest possible banking sector with loans as an asset for the banking sector, deposits as a liability, and I'm going, to, I'm going to name the equity bank. So I'll just do that quickly. So if I, again, you can't see, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't show you the scale larger. larger. So I call this loans. Uh, doing stuff live, you always make typing mistakes. You're looking at the screen rather than the keyboard. Notice this plus and minus key here. When I click on plus, I create a new column. It defaults to being an asset, but I want it to be liability. So I now say type deposits here. And then click again, defaults to being liability, make that into equity and call this bank. Having done that, if I go back to Minsky, you now notice there are two columns. There should be a third. It shall turn up at some stage. I'll just shut that, one. Shut that down for a second. Ah, why is bank not turned up? I'll just add some more data. So let's say there's loans of 100. 
and deposits of shown as minus 90 and bank equity of my, shown as minus 10. Having done that, now you can see loans, deposits and bank are all turning up there as down the bottom of the bank. Those are the, those are the flows that exist, or stocks rather, that exist in the system. I don't know why I've got an error message there. I made some sort of mistake. Okay. So you get that sort of set up to begin with. And the thing at the top there, the green, the black, the, the blue bit, I'll just bring it back up here, that's just a label. So we're not using it yet, but the intention is to ultimately use that as a as a, as a class statement effectively. So you've made a you know, working class, capitalist class, bank class, that would be defined by, by the element you gave to the to the icon here. We also make the icons different, so households and factories and things like that rather than just bank icons as we have at the moment. And notice the summing to zero of not just the, each row in terms of the flow operations, but also the initial conditions. Again, that's something which is very hard to do with a set of the standard differential equations or the flow chart because you, could, you, you don't necessarily make them sum to zero. You can make that error. Minsky forces you to get it right. So the fundamental operations are lending, repaying, uh, and, and oh, sorry, I've got the wrong labels there, pay interest and repay debt. So I'm going to enter those. So back up to the table. Notice there's a plus key here. That gives you an additional row for operations. So I say lend money, and that's just a label at the moment too. I type the word lend here and minus lend in the deposit column. You can see Minsky's added that to the bank icon. And then pay interest. Of course, the interest increases the equity of the bank. So I'm going to go, say, INT here and minus INT over here. And then repay loan. So have repay as a positive entry here because the positive entry reduces the size of the bank's liability and it becomes a negative entry on the asset side because it reduces the size of the bank's asset. So now you've got those three operations. This is another bug. Uh, I've got to show this to Russell. They, they should all be the same size as these ones down here and they should be aligned. So this is coming out of a, a modification of the program. We've just done a major what's called refactoring. So when you write computer software, like for example me learning about double entry, okay, and I've got all this code to support single entry, and then you cludge and add a double entry component to it. But we also made it possible to resize. Um, we could resize other objects before we could resize the um, the um, godly icon. I've got another bug just popped up there, so I'll have to shut that one down. For some reason, I'm now caught in a dialog box I can't see. So um, as I said, save early and save often. There are bugs in the software, and if you save it, if you don't save it and a bug turns up, you'll hate me. Okay, so save it beforehand. So some sort of bug has got there, and I don't know what it is, and I can't see the dialog box. I'll just shut this one down. Maybe I can, if I tap around, I can't see a dialog box turning up, so some other bug has popped up. I'll have to, I've lost what I've done there, so I've got to, I've got to choose another. So I choose file. Yeah, it's, it's frozen, so I don't know what's going on there. That's a serious bug. I'll define another window in a moment. But that's... Once I've got it done properly, and I've got this in another uh, file, of course, there I've got your basic operations. And you can see, again, those conventions. Positive entries increase assets. Negative entries reduce them. That makes sense. And it's obvious. Negative entries increase liabilities, and positive ones reduce them. It makes sense, but it's not obvious. But what you're doing is adding a negative to a negative, so you've increased the, side, the magnitude. And then negative increase, in, increase equity which is what's going on over here, positive ones reduce it. That's counterintuitive, but it forces that rule that all rows sum to zero. That's why it's done. One question. Yeah. Um, this is like a chance in, in Minsky, if, if like some function you would need for your, for your personal research, it's not included yet. Could you like program it your own by, by like somehow? Yeah, if, you're, if you can write in C++, uh, the code's open source, so you can get in there and add the features you want. Um, there's, a, there's a GitHub resource where that's managed. Get in touch with Russell if you intend giving that a try. Of course, you can do it to your own version. You can download the source code and change it in your own version. If you want to commit back to the version we distribute to other people, Russell has to make sure it fits in. Okay, But definitely that's there, and we'd love to have more people helping us do that. Um, 
one other thing about the flow is positive is the initiator. It's the, that's the source. A negative is the recipient. Okay, in, in virtually every case. So what's happening behind the scenes is that set of differential equations is being defined by Minsky. Okay, and the different you know you know that these things are going to be stock flow consistent. Anything that in, in, increments one will decrement another and vice versa. And also, notice all these stocks are now shown as positives here. There are no negatives there. So a flow that increases a stock is shown as a flow. So loan, lending increases loans, repayment reduces it. Lending increases deposits, repayments reduce it. Um, and what that does is you've got a mapping between an accounting view of the world, which makes sense in the design phase, and a mathematics view, which makes sense in, in analyzing it later. And then what it also does is automatically generate the multiple assets and liabilities view of each of each uh, flow. Because if you take a look at the, um, I'll bring up another icon, another one here. If I click on here, and I'll just quickly call this, let's say, let's make this asset, and I'll have reserves and then loans. And then I'm going to have liabilities of, say, firms and then workers and then finally the equity of the bank. Having done all that, I've now got those, should be five accounts. There again, there's a bit of a delay bug going. I'll put the initial amounts. Let's say there's reserves of 100 and loans, initially loans of 10, and the firms have got uh, minus 60, and the workers have got, say, minus 40, and the bankers have got minus 10 in equity. Having done all that, if I now say let's bring down another banking icon here and call this, say, the uh, workers, and so give me some assets here. It's looking for things which are liabilities elsewhere. Well, there's workers. Any liabilities, look for an asset somewhere else. Loans or reserves, that's not an asset for them. And finally, click here and say what the equity is. I can get the gap between the two. At the moment, you can see, if I call this uh, workers, worker equity, Then you notice that Minsky's got 40 here, and not not a minus 40 over here. It's telling me I've got to effectively give work, workers value the value the equity an extra a value of 40. So, in this particular model here, I've got um, the non-banking sector. I've got the banking sector over here. Where I have lending interest and repay, and loans, deposit, and bank. And then when I create a non-banking banking sector, uh, the Deposits there are an asset of the bank. They're a liability of the banking sector over here. They're an asset of the non-banking sector over here. And the loans, which were an asset of the banking sector, are a liability of the non-banking sector. So it's doing all that double entry matching for you. And if I add interest as a flow for the equity for the non-bank sector, that it pay me interest reduces the equity of the non-bank sector. And notice I've got, notice up here, if I, from that initial model I showed you, I had uh, loans of 100 and deposits of 90 and bank equity of minus 10, which therefore means in system dynamics terms, a positive equity for the banking sector. To make that balance for the non-banking sector, I've got to show that its equity is actually a positive entry of 10, meaning in real terms, negative equity. So the equity of the, if the banking, really banking sector is positive, the equity of the non-banking sector is negative. And that's, again, the whole idea about somebody else, somebody's assets being somebody else's liabilities, but the whole system is integrated. So that rule has to oppose. Now, that's one little thing I've left out of that. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show you a full model I've put together very rapidly with all those elements to it. So I have a banking sector, a firm sector, and households. Uh, the operations I have here... Uh, lending to firms, interest payments by firms, debt repayment by firms,
deposit interest paid by the banking sector to firms, deposit interest by the banking sector paid to the households, wages paid by the firms to the households, consumption by the households, consumption by the banks. Now that's enough to illustrate the paradox of thrift. Why well, I've got the model set up because I've made sliders here for various things like the rate of lending, the rate of repayment, the interest rate on loans, interest rate on deposits, how fast the firm sector turns over money in its account, which generates GDP, how much of a GDP goes to workers versus firms uh, or capitalists, how much fast workers consume and how fast the banking sector consumes. So I'll simulate now that at the moment with lending exactly equal to repayment, so no change in the amount of money. But let's imagine workers decide they want to save more money. So rather than having workers consuming on a, on a, a weekly basis, they go out to consuming on a fortnightly basis. And what happens? Yes, they get more money in their account, but their incomes fall. Okay. You've got a slower rate of turnover of money, enabling them to accumulate more of the money that exists. So the amount of money in the household account, as you can see here, has risen. But it's risen at the expense of incomes falling, including workers' incomes. Workers' wages have gone down. Okay. Now, that's a really hard concept to illustrate with standard um, economic thinking. It's a breeze to illustrate that with Minsky. And I can also illustrate, let's set this out of the way, lending, creating money, because of the rate of lending increases and the rate of repayment slows down, then you get an increased economic activity and a growth in money in the system. Again, very easy to illustrate with Minsky. And that is the set of equations defined by that model. So again, Minsky is self-documenting and guarantees stock flow consistency. Yeah. So how do you get the parameter-wise? You put them yourself? In yourself yeah, in yeah. The, which, the yeah, well, where well, you put the parameters. It, it's what I've, what I've defined here. Like all these things are, those are flows. These are stocks. But I want to multiply them by various parameters. So I simply define them on the on the palette and put make them sliders so I can change them as the model is simulated. And do we have a chance to, to link this link Minsky to real data? So yep. Not well done, but this little icon up here is the data icon. So if you click on that, whack it somewhere on the screen and then uh, choose import data, you can specify the CSV file you're importing the data from. And then have, and you can actually derive your parameters from the data if you want to. I'll show you an example of somebody having done that uh, at the end of the talk. So you can actually do mixed um, godly table and flowchart modeling as well. But at the moment, it's not enforcing stock flow consistency between those two paradigms. So you've got to work a bit harder to make sure you get that right. Again, at the later stage, I want to make sure that we enforce any stock flow interactions between a godly table system and the flowchart is correct. But I'll quickly show you how you can use a model like this. You all know Krugman and his loanable funds fixation? Okay. Well, he and Eggertson published a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics where they had in, in the appendix a really shitty little model of a bank where the bank was a one-sector loan in the, in the consumption good of a dreadful bloody piece of crap. But anyway, I thought what I'd do is take that model and say, well, strictly speaking, if you actually, if that was actually the structure of capitalist economy, if banks were just intermediaries, you'd be right. Lending wouldn't have much effect on the macro economy. So what I did was take that silly structure they had there and put it in Minsky. And what I have here is much what I've shown you for the model we just saw a moment ago, where I have lending, repayment, interest payments. But because lending is going between the consumer sector and the investment sector in Krugman's model, the bank is simply charging a fee. The bank's income comes out of charging a fee to the consumer sector for being the introduction agency between the borrower, the saver, which is the consumer sector, and the borrower, which is the investment sector. I call this the Ashley Madison vision of banking. Now, they don't actually screw you. They find somebody else is willing to screw you. Pardon me. I'm getting so sick of people, you know, Krugman pushing that model as though it's a description of reality. Anyway, having done that, I can now run a model where I'll just take, take you through the various stages of the model. There's lending, debt repayment, interest payments, paying a bank fee, consumption sector hiring workers, investment sector hiring workers, the investment sector purchasing consumer goods, 
the consumer sector purchasing investment goods, the workers consuming, the bankers consuming, the bankers investing. Okay? All basic simple operations, all defined down here using the flowcharts to make various definitions. Uh, now, if I simulate this model, notice the growth rate of the economy is zero. GDP is flatlining at 200, and the debt ratio is climbing. There's no impact upon the level of money in the economy. And if I have a faster level of lending, the rate of the growth of the economy actually dips a bit. And if I have very slow repayment, it dips occasionally, but always turns back to zero. And you've got a rising level of debt in the economy, but no impact upon GDP. Now, if you then go to have a, a plunge in the level of lending, a much faster repayment, pardon me, the growth rate actually accelerates and much slower lending, growth rate rises once more. You have a plunge in the debt to GDP ratio. No particular impact on GDP. It's gone up a bit, but it'll come back down to 200 ultimately. So in that sense, massive changes to finance, bugger all changes to macroeconomics. And that's the vision that neoclassicals have. Now, one of the beauties of Minsky is I can say, well, that's an interesting model. Unfortunately, it's not the real world. It's not true that debt is an asset of the financial sector. So I'm going to do, it's not, not true that debt is an asset of the consumer sector. Banks lend money. So let's just delete this fiction that the lending is from one non-bank agent to another. So delete that column. And then delete all the so-called lending and repayment operations between the consumer sector and the investment sector. And come across to the banking sector and say, well, let's naturally treat reality, debt is an asset of the banking sector. And notice this drop down here, because I've deleted debt as an asset of the consumer sector, it's still sitting in the system as a liability of the investment sector. So it's currently an unallocated liability. So if I click on this little down arrow here, and I'm in the asset column, Minsky goes looking for any unallocated liability. Click on D and it brings across the operations that currently exist. Now I've deleted the... Um, the interest and the fee operations are still there, but I've deleted one of the two entries. So the interest payments are made to the bank. And the idea of a bank fee itself is a fiction. Let's delete that. There's more changes I need to make to the system to make it completely consistent. Let's go back to the initial setting where I had loans doubling every seven years and repayment halving debt levels over nine years and simulate it. And I've got a positive rate of growth, a growing GDP. Increasing debt causes increasing money supply. If lending happens more rapidly, the economy grows more rapidly. If repayment's slower, the economy grows faster still. And if you have a desire to repay loans and a slower rate of lending, you get a slump. Now try making that comparison that rapidly with any other software package. Okay? It just shows get your structural reality right and money matters and you can't ignore it the way the neoclassicals try to ignore it. So that's the sort of thing I wrote Minsky to make feasible to model very, very rapidly. And literally I can make a change from the neoclassical learnable visions of a version of the world to the endogenous money real world in about 30 seconds. Okay. Now, what I've shown you so far is toy models, and that's all I really have developed with Minsky so far. But in the last year I've been blown out of the water by two masters, one masters and one PhD student. Uh, the, the PhD student was put as a poll and came across to a, uh, Kingston for a, a year to sit in our courses as he developed his model. He's done a complete model of the, Portuguese, of the Polish economy using Minsky. Uh, I won't show you his. I'll show you the, the Portuguese one because he's now doing a PhD with me. So this model is a model done in Minsky, including importing data to fit to various data, data series uh, of the Portuguese economy. It's a mess. Okay, no argument, it's not a mess. The, the reason all this crap down here is because of definitions. So all these things coming together here, I'll bring up the model and show it to you. Uh, hang on, I've got to... So that's the model. And this one here, for example, is defining the government deficit and the deficit of the financial sector. Um, 
including debt from the rest of the world, interest rate from the government sector, public debt interest rate, all that's being defined together. You could actually define it using a set of equations like over here. So I intend tidying up the definition process so you don't have to have all these messy definitions here in a later stage. But just to show you the scale of this model, it has a government sector, households, productive sector, financial sector, and rest of the world. And all the uh, double entry bookkeeping is being done by Minsky in the background to make sure that stock flow consistent. So it looks like a mess at that scale. I want to drastically improve what Minsky can do at a later stage. But this particular model is a more, a more successful estimate of the Portuguese economy than the model of the Portuguese central bank. Okay? So you can go a hell of a long way. That's the system of differential equations and the, not just the differential equations, not the, um, not the um, parameters and, and, var and variables coming out of it defined in that model by, by Pedro using Minsky. Now, I, I simply don't believe anybody could do that without a tool like Minsky. Just do too complicated. Maybe using the, the, the godly little VAR approach you need to use, maybe you could do it, but I, I don't think you'd get there. So that's, that's what Minsky can do. It's going to do a lot more if I get more development funding. So if you want to donate to that uh, website of mine, please do. It'll go to Russell. Uh, but I want to do a few few more issues now, and that's and I'll finish up at about half an hour. You need a break yet, or keep on going? Okay, change the topic. How do you do macro? Yeah. Now the neoclassicals think you've got to work from micro foundations. By the way, Olivia Blanchard and I've been in touch with each other recently, getting a pleasant conversation. I'm pleased to say. Have you seen my satirical piece in the Review of Keynesian Economics? You haven't. Okay, I'll bring it up later. Um, but I satirized Olivia a bit, and he actually wrote back saying he thought it was funny. So I'm pleased about that. It's a good reaction. There's a, there's a chance for a dialogue happening now with neoclassicals, which I think is a positive thing after all these decades of the two areas ignoring what the neoclassicals ignoring us. And in talking about why DSGs were so unsuccessful, he still thinks we can use them. And he thought, well, you have to start from micro foundations. Where else to start from? And this is a what uh, a physicist called... Uh, Philip Anderson called a constructivist f uh, fallacy, and this guy, this is a real, this is a real PH, this is a real Nobel Prize. That gets in physics. He wrote a wonderful paper called "More Is Different," which, of course, I've linked here, and I'd recommend you taking a look at. And he said reductionism has worked brilliantly for science over decades, over centuries, but getting to where science is now, they they have to go beyond reductionism. He said one thing reductionism doesn't mean is you can have a constructionist approach to science. He said the fact that you can reduce every to simple fundamental laws doesn't mean you can take those laws and build the universe. Okay? If it did, an obvious question in a biology exam would be, please take these chemicals and create life. Okay? Imagine a... That would be a great question, wouldn't it? But that's what economists are trying to do. They think they should start from the micro and be able to build the macro from it. That's like saying a biologist is only going to be a biologist if they can tell you how to, how to make life out of, out of inert chemicals, which is nonsense. And as he finished up by saying that it, 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 in each level of analysis, whether you're looking at biology or psychology or chemistry or physics, so it's, it's at least as complex ways of thinking at each of those levels, which you can't reduce to the level below. But that's what economists have been trying to do for one and a half centuries. They've been trying to turn macroeconomics into applied micro. So I want to show a different approach, and that's say let's derive macro from macro. So what happens if you take a set of definitions that you simply are true by definition? The employment rate is the number of workers with a job divided by population. The wages share of GDP is wages divided by GDP. And the debt ratio is debt divided by GDP. Take those and differentiate them with respect to time, you get a system of differential equations. Okay. Put in the simplest possible linear definitions you can. So a constant capital output ratio, labor productivity, a linear Phillips curve, a linear investment function, what do you get? You get the model I've just shown you. And that simple model, working from macro definitions, finds something neoclassicals couldn't work out. So it's just wrong to believe we have to start from the micro level and build up. That's why, again, the reason I'm in, in favour of the system approach. Build the structure of the model, the dynamics will emerge from it. And this is, again, the argument that, that Anderson finished with. 
because you can have a hierarchy of sciences, they can rank quantum mechanics as the fundamental level and then many body uh, physics coming out of that and then chemistry coming out of many body physics and biology coming out of chemistry and then psychology coming out of biology and, and so on. You said it doesn't mean science X is just applied Y. Um, psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry, and macro is not applied micro. So that's my overall philosophical approach. Let's build macro out of macro. You don't have to go to the micro level. A question or? Okay. okay. Another issue, and this is one of you know I've been talk working on this for a long time, the role of credit in macroeconomics. And that's really the topic of the next book I've written, which is coming out in April. It's not a one-word book, but it could be. And what I do is look at the overall credit dynamics for major economies in the world and say you can actually predict the financial crisis by collapsing credit, which is what I'm showing there for America. But credit is, is, is I've always had the gut intuition that it's part of aggregate demand. It's also part of aggregate income. Now, this is ignored because neoclassicals, like Krugman, obviously, so you can forget about it because one person's asset is another person's liability. Who cares? That's about as deep as Krugman gets. Uh, but post-Keynesians haven't incorporated properly either because they say that uh, rather than looking at the asset as liability, as liability truism, they say expenditure is income as a truism, and therefore, where's the role for credit? I've had fairly intense conversations on this front, I think you're aware, uh, which end up saying there's no role for credit in demand or income. But there is, and it's simple to show it. And what I'm showing here is a, imagine you divide the economy into three sectors, S1, S2, S3, and a banking sector with both loans, so the basic assets, liabilities, and equity view. This is looking now at the, as a system of an economy with three sectors, uh, where sector one spends on sector two and sector three. So expenditure by sector one and sector two becomes income for sector two and sector three. Ditto for sector two and ditto for sector three. The bank having no role at the moment. I haven't got anything coming out of the bank. The negative sum of the diagonal is aggregate expenditure. The sum of the off-diagonal elements is aggregate income. So there's aggregate expenditure. What is it equal to? Okay. There's aggregate income. What's it equal to? That's where the idea of the identity of the two comes from. So that's a world where there's neither borrowing nor lending. What about a loanable funds world, which is the world Krugman inhabits? Well, you have, if sector one is borrowing L dollars per year from sector two, then there has to be a stock of outstanding debt, capital L, and the reason sector one, sector two is lending to sector one is because of the interest payments that requires sector one to make to sector two. So I can bring that onto the model and say that now sector two is lending a flow to sector one. So that's the little L here, minus L here, plus L there. And then sector one has to pay interest to sector two. That's row times capital L here as a minus and row times capital L here as a plus. I'm not using Minsky's accounting conventions anymore. I'm just looking at positive and negative flows decrementing the amount of money in each of those accounts. If you sum up aggregate expenditure, there's now a role for the financial flows involved. The financial flows are part of aggregate expenditure. And that's gross, by the way. If I had banks paying interest, I'd also have deposit interest times deposits as well as loan interest times loans as part of aggregate ex uh, expenditure. There's aggregate income. And of course, it's the same. It includes income of the financial sector. So again, the identity is still maintained. Now the real world, endogenous money. So where you don't borrow from sec sector one, doesn't borrow from sector two or sector three, it borrows from the bank. And sector one pays interest to the banking sector. So I now have a borrowing of L, L, little L dollars per year from the banking sector and paying interest of row times L, capital L to the banking sector. So now I've got the banking sector involved there. If I add up aggregate expenditure, I get the flow of credit as part of aggregate expenditure. And add up aggregate income, I get the flow of credit as part of aggregate income as well. So it's completely valid to include credit as part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. And of course, aggregate capital gains as well when you include that. So this is the factor we've left out even of post-Keynesian thinking, except in, uh, implicitly in Minsky's own logic. If you read Minsky carefully, you'll see he's got a clear role for credit, but he couldn't 
quite articulate it to the stage where he convinced his, his, his uh, post-Keynesian followers. So what you've got, expenditure is fundamentally monetary, and there are two sources of expenditure. Turnover of existing money, which is what, what all the a, A's, B's and C's are, um, and new expenditure finance one for one by debt. Because when you borrow money, you're borrowing to spend it. And using that, you can, uh, that's what I've done in the book to identify the countries that I expect to have a financial crisis because they both have high levels of private debt. So this is a level of private debt exceeding 1.5 times GDP here. And then credit being responsible for a substantial proportion of demand, over 10% of GDP equivalent for the amount of money coming from credit and therefore very susceptible to a slowdown in the rate of growth of credit. So that's another issue I, want to, I would like you guys to build on because – you are the successors to most people like myself and Mark Lavoie now, okay? Mark and I used to sit around tables like you're sitting around now, never thinking anything about the role we'd have later in life. Now we both find ourselves elders of the post-Keynesian community. It's weird, okay? But we're delighted to have you coming along with Sam sessions like this because you're going to replace us. And really there wasn't necessarily a feeling that was going to happen even 10 years ago. But now there's such a community of you people out there. You're the ones who are going to carry this work forward. So that's one thing I've left half finished. I'd like to see some of you work further on it. Another one I've just done, and I want this also, I'd like to see this taken further, is that we've had no theory of, no, no school of economics has properly included the role of energy in capitalism, which is ridiculous because we try to model production as if you can produce output using labour and capital alone. And that applies to everybody, neoclassicals, post-Keynesian, Sraffians, Marxians, the whole lot. Um, Post-Keynesians have output. Oh, okay, that's, that's, that's animated in the wrong point. That's neoclassical, obviously. Uh, but neoclassicals have got the Cobb-Douglas production function where they have output, you know, smoothly combining labour and capital. Post-Keynesians have output using fixed proportions. Uh, and I've had neoclassicals argue to me that we can just treat energy as a form of capital. No, you can't. Capital means produced means of production. Yeah. And so, and so uh, energy, you kind of like from the amount of effort you exert into work? Effectively, yeah, but I mean everything from you know, the lunch you've just had, meaning you haven't fallen asleep yet during my talk, uh, through to the through the oil you might pour into your car to, head, to drive off from here back home. So every form of energy with no intrinsic role for energy in any economic model because energy is something you can't produce. Okay. Okay. If you believe you can produce energy, you believe in perpetual motion machines. And I've had neoclassical economists come out with comments like that without realizing it, what's it mean. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay. You just find it. And that's the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, but you can't produce output without energy. So I was – a guy called Bob Ayers has built a, a, like a generalized version of Cobb Douglas where energy is another input like capital and labor. And Bob's a good friend, but I was never happy with that rendition. Yeah. So, um, so if you were to exert, um, if you were to put energy into the into a model, for example, we'd be looking at various conversions of energy itself, um, and, and not necessarily as a finite sort of product, of energy, yeah. but in various forms. Yeah. You look at this, like, what I, what I'd like to see done, obviously, is have renewable energy, the stuff that's actually coming into this room, courtesy of the sun, despite the fact that we're in England. Okay. Renewable energy like that, stored energy, both solar, both um, you know fossil fuels and nuclear, in, include. And of course, you, you're going to run down the stored energy, the fossil fuels and the nuclear. You're not going to run down the solar. So you'd have, and of course, using the solar has got different implications to using fossil fuel. There's a huge amount of detail we need to do to incorporate ecology properly into economics and vice versa. But we hadn't until last year come up with an equation where energy played an essential role. And the little insight that made me work out what uh, you need to do to do this is that the whole idea of labour without energy is a, is a farce. If you can find labour without energy, you've found a corpse. Okay. And if you have a machine without energy, it's not a machine, it's a sculpture. It won't move. Okay. So the insight was let's define GDP as useful work. And frankly, that's that in some ways, that's the most sensible definition I've ever found, and I just made it up last year. GDP fundamentally means useful work. So you can actually put in that sense, the idea of GDP 
ultimately is a manifestation of is useful, useful energy, the useful application of energy. And define labour and capital as ways of harnessing energy. So your basic equation becomes GDP, which is a function of energy, is itself produced by using capital as an energy extraction mechanism and labour as an energy extraction mechanism. You go back far enough, it's slaves, okay? You come up to the modern days, it's the Falcon 9 rocket. But fundamentally in both cases, we're using those means of exploiting energy we find in the environment. So actual work by, done by capital and labour depends upon several things. How many units you've got? Now, it's easy to find units of unskilled labour. It's problematic, as we know in this room, to define units of capital. But I'm going to stick with that to begin with. You multiply that by the flow of energy harnessed by each of them. So how many calories can you guys eat a day? Four or 5,000 calories per day, I reckon. How many calories can a machine consume? If you go back to the days of, of, uh, of James Watt, not very many. You go forward to the days of Elon Musk, a hell of a lot. Multiplied by the ratio of, avail of, 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 of useful energy, the energy you can actually exploit, the energy you can't which is the basic idea that some energy has to be wasted because you're dumping into an environment with a background radiation level above absolute zero, multiplied by how efficiently you're using that energy. And that's your basic expression. So I'm now saying GDP is a function of number of machines times energy uh, per machine times the available energy to the total energy times the efficiency, and ditto for labour as well. And I can call this XL for exergy ratio for labour. I suppose I've got the wrong labels. There should be K there and should be L there. So now I've got this expression. And if I put that in the start with a neoclassical form, which is the idea of constant returns to scale and multiplicative form, I rework that. What I get is the Cobb Douglas production function <coughs> times the energy input for labour times the energy input for machinery. Yeah. So, um, so, um, would I be assuming that um, using a standard measure of energy in this case? Yeah, you'd have to use a standard measure. So, like I've talked about calories for work for, for people and, you know, uh, therm BTUs for, for machines, but you need to convert all to BTUs to do it sensibly. But of course, when you think about what's involved in labour, um, there's, there's your Cabot Cobb Douglas function. There's the energy for labour. Now, energy for labour. Your maximum amount of energy that a labourer consumes, maybe, maybe on average 4,000 calories, okay? That's a constant. Uh, the efficiency, the, ex, the available energy to what you can actually use as work may be of 0.5 ratio. If you eat 4,000 calories, you might be able to do 2,000 calories of useful work per day. And your efficiency may be 0.5. So you can pretty much treat that as a constant, okay? And you raise it to a power... Well, you know, it's going to be some number between zero and 500, that sort of thing. Whereas for the machine, the energy parameters for capital are the energy consumption per machine per day. Now, that's risen dramatically over time from trivial amounts back in the days of, of what? Even more trivial amounts if you take it back to the days of, um, you know, fantasies like the Game of Thrones. Um, the, and then the XK, which is the available energy, out of the energy you put into a machine, and the efficiency, they're time varying. They would have gone up and down at various times over history, hopefully going up all the time, but certainly you have to have a maximum below one. And you're raising that to a power. So what you get is this expression, where I've just treated the labour components as a constant, multiplied by labour raised to one minus alpha, times K to the alpha, times the energy exploited by a machine also raised to the alpha. Compare that to Cobb Douglas production function, it implies that this, which is what's called the solo residual when you actually empirically estimate it, is actually the energy contribution of machinery. And looking at what Ayers and Kummel put together, they had this format where they used alpha, k to the alpha, l to the beta, and e to the 1 minus alpha minus beta. Um, for a start, this form is more realistic. It has one less degree of freedom, so it's actually harder to estimate. But you can actually put it in output per capita form and capital labour ratio form, which you can't do the Kumalayas formulation. <clears throat> you can also relate it to useful output per machine because 
if I define all this by L, uh, I've now got this as a scaling factor rather than a statement of marginal productivity. And I can actually, <coughs> we don't know what K is. Okay? That's one of the problems. We don't know what e energy per machine is, but we do know energy consumption by industry. There are good stats on that. So, by, um, so, of, um, so, so your problem you're having right now is, um, in a sense, you cannot um, properly identify the measurement for energy in relation to capital. No, not per machine, but you can define it in the aggregate because there's empirical data on this. If I say the sum of energy used by the industry mm -hmm. sector, it can be substituted by the number of two. I've got number of machines which we don't know. This that's a hypothetical thing because there's no such thing as a aggregate number of machines. You know, adding computers to um, to lasers. Uh, but we do know the aggregate amount of energy used by industry, and in fact, we know by each individual industry to some detail with the Department of Energy Statistics in America. So I can substitute that in, and what I get is this expression. Total output is some constant representing the energy input for unskilled labour times employment to the 1 minus alpha times the energy used in industry to alpha times these two unknowns, which are the exergy relationship for energy and the efficiency with which energy is used. So if I substitute the whole thing together, I can also put it in per capita form. Divide through by, you know, so I've got GDP per head. And I can now rearrange this and get this in terms of the employment rate. So GDP per capita, energy contribution for labour, times the employment rate, times energy per capita. Again, we have data for that, times these two unknown factors over here. So I've got data for this, data for that, data for this, don't know these two. Put it together, and here's what I want to fit. There's GDP per capita in America since 1965. That's the employment rate since 1965. By the way, this is why Donald Trump got elected. Okay, That's how many less workers have got a job now than had it back in 2000 and 2007. Okay. Yeah. Can you speak up if my, he if my hearing is bad? Yeah. Would you mind walking up a bit? Because my hearing is so bad at the distance, your voice is hard for me to understand. So, okay, what I'm trying to say is, um, you considering energy as a distinct input can be a little, I feel like it could be problematic because I see a lot of complex relationship among themselves uh, labor input, uh, labor capital, and energy. Density. Because although we cannot create energy. We need labor and capital to maybe find energy. Oh, yeah, to find it, yes. Yeah. Find it. So mm. the, there's that kind of relationship there, first of all. Yeah. So in resources, when you resource theory, you have real uh, hierarchies of resources, some are upfront resources, space, whatever you want. Yeah. So some of them act on other ones in yeah. order to get other ones. So there's that kind of complex interactions among them. Well, that's what I want to do at some stage as well, because if you think about Schraffer's critique of uh, the, the idea of marginal productivity of capital, his critique involved production using labour and capital only. Solid critique, because it shows the whole Cambridge controversy problems that the neoclassicals ignore, but what I'm saying is if we, act, we have to actually, to be genuine, we have to have labour, capital and energy being used to produce next year's round of both GDP and capital. So the reduction Sraf has done is incomplete. We can do a reduction to energy as well. And we can have the more specific, the more we drill down, the more specific that energy becomes. You can actually have energy which is just mechanical energy or energy used in making iron and steel, which is a different manifestation to energy used in making um, tables. Okay, So you can do all that sort of breakdown. I think we can actually, that's, that's, an, that's a research agenda for the future, which is why I'm showing you this stuff right now. I take your point, but it's to me, 
it's a reason to go deeper into this. But I want to show you what happens even at a very superficial level. There's the employment rate. And now let's take a look at energy consumption per head, which I was amazed to find peaked actually back in 1979. This is the actual, this is data from the um, uh, Europa project, but it's derived from the American Department of Energy. So there's been quite dramatic fall in energy consumption per head, which of course would actually be turning up largely in the efficiency stats that I don't know. Okay. The efficiency, those two efficiency components, the exergy relate ratio and the efficiency of energy. I don't know those two, and they're probably unknowable. But when you put those two together using that equation, I go from a correlation, I think, of 0.59 for looking just at the relationship between GDP per head and the employment rate, and 0.62 at looking at GDP per head and energy alone to 0.78 in that combined equation. So just with uh, um, um, employment only at a correlation coefficient of 0.62, just with energy, 0.59, with the two, 0.79. So it's very powerful, even at that superficial aggregate level. Um, but what I think you get out of this is something that lets you look at the dynamics of energy, innovation, and finance and class struggle all in one, because you've got the class struggle stuff turning up on the employment rate, investment and innovation turning up in capital, and the amount of energy that those machines can consume. Finance and class struggle turning up on the whole thing. So I think we can actually also link the ecology this way, and that's, again, something which my generation of, of, of post-Keynesians heterodox economists haven't done. It's for your generation to get it done. And I think it can give us something which is incontrovertible. The neoclassicals can't argue against this without arguing against the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah. Like class struggle. Okay, can you do me the same favour of my hearing? Sorry. I can also just... Uh, class struggle, how does it enter the market? Because that's in terms of the employment rate. And if you think about what's going on technologically, all technological change fundamentally has been labour replacing. Now, one reason behind that is because capital, if you can work, make a machine that does the same job as a human, the amount of energy that machine can harness to produce the output is far greater than the labour can, can do. So if you think about the original spinning jenny, that replaced a person operating with a spinning wheel, one person, one thread. First spinning jenny, I think, was 16 threads together. Ultimate ones, a couple of hundred. So the amount of energy being used by the producer was enormous, which made, the, in that class struggle sense, kick the worker out, get a machine that does it. The individual capitalist benefits from a huge increase in their productivity. The worker loses out. But then ultimately the worker gets back in there again because you need a worker to operate the machines and Income distribution dynamics become important, but the overall trend was certainly at the very beginning of it now with robotics and 3D printing and so on. It's quite feasible to imagine a world in which there's almost no unskilled labour. Okay. There'll be unskilled labour. Well, not, there'll be skilled labour in services, but not in manufacturing, which is a huge change coming away in your lifetimes. And we still haven't got any... This, this I hope, is the beginning of this, a way of being able to analyze that. So that's uh, pretty much my presentation there. I've whacked a few little exercises if anyone wants to give it a try. Those are some classic equations. If you can't work them out, I've cheated and whacked the solutions in there for you as well. And uh, if anyone wants to have a real crack at using Minsky, see if you can use it to show by running a government surplus is a really stupid idea, which of the Minsky model is easy to illustrate. Well, that's it for me.